there's a lot of opportunity, especially in the multi-tenant shopping center space. That's become a very lucrative, exciting space. And it's a space I've specialized in for years now because it's one of the few spaces in commercial real estate where a lot of product is available at a cap rate that's higher than the current interest rates. Do you love your job, but want other investment options than your company's 401k and trying to pick stocks? If so, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, you will get actionable information for your passive real estate investment journey. Welcome back to another episode of Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Here's your host, Justin Dixon. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. I'm your host, Justin Dixon. And today we've got Dan Lukowitz on the podcast. We talk about his 15-year journey going from working with his friends, starting a business that helps retrofit existing houses for becoming handicap accessible. Super interesting how they started that business. We talk about his journey flipping 75 houses over the course of his career, moving into running sales at a title company. And then we really dive deep into triple net leases, what they are, how to invest in them, what the benefits are compared to multifamily. It's a really, really interesting conversation with Dan. So let's get Dan on the pod. All right, Dan, man, welcome to the podcast. Happy to have you on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Looking forward. Sweet. Well, let's jump right in here. Give us a little bit of an overview of who you are, where you are, and what you're up to. Yeah, so I'm Dan Lukowitz. I'm a senior director here at Encore Real Estate Investment Services. I'm based here out of Metro Detroit, but we do transact nationwide. Last year, we transacted in 43 of 50 states, did 320 deals for a total of 985 million dollars. And you know, we specialize exclusively in single tenant net lease investment sales as well as shopping centers, some other ancillary asset classes, but that's really our bread and butter. And I'm here to help buyers and sellers transact and you know achieve their investment goals. Got it. So my wheelhouse from investing and most of the people that I've talked to are more in the multifamily apartment syndication investment world. So I haven't really uh, personally dove into triple net lease. So I'm very interested to kind of learn about the similarities and differences from an operator perspective, but also from an investor perspective. Because I think when we were off air, you mentioned that you obviously are a broker, but you also do some investing in this space as well. So I'll be curious, can you get both sides of the coin, if you will? So I guess first, I always like to learn about people's kind of origins and how they got into real estate. So how did you kind of learn about being a broker or were you an investor first or kind of how did that all work? Yeah. So it was really a long journey. Um, I started back in 2005, around the time I was graduating college. I worked with some friends to help form a new company called Disability Made Easy, which is still in existence. It's a barrier-free home modification company specializing in making homes handicap accessible for individuals with terminal illness, disability, disease, et cetera. I did all the sales and marketing. That was really my background. And while I was doing that, I had a lot of uh, hands-on experience with our project manager. And we would go visit homes. And I remember, I'll never forget, this was like kind of my aha moment. We visited a home. There was an individual there who had been in a car accident. And we went up into the property and we walked out. And afterwards, we walked out and looked at the project manager. I said, what are you going to do here? I mean, there's no way that this property could be made handicap accessible. He took out some graph paper and a pencil. And in about 90 seconds, he sketched a brand new front elevation, new layout. And it just kind of like floored me recognizing that you could take something in a certain status, certain situation and uh, add to it, even though it might look functionally obsolete, add value. And then at the end, it's something that is suitable for its current application. So for me, you know, that kind of really stuck with me. And as I kind of moved through the phases of my life, when it became time for me a couple of years later to buy my first home, I had the opportunity to buy a house that was moving ready. Keep in mind, this is the middle, I should say, of the recession. And I had an opportunity to buy a house that was moving ready, but I'd heard that one block over there was a property that was bank owned. I reached out to the lender, got in touch with them, bought the house for a third of the price of the fair market value of the other, managed all the renovations myself, absolutely fell in love with house flipping, as crazy as that sounds. And renovated that house, bought another house, did that. Then it became kind of like an investment thing. And at this point, I probably flipped 75 or 80 homes and kind of recognized that real estate was where my passion was. I wasn't ready to dive in 100% full time yet. I was working as a development director. And then later, I ran a sales department for a title insurance agency so I could learn about title, learn about that Mm. side of the business. And then I finally, my last stop in, in corporate America was at Amazon as a business development executive. All the while, I was flipping houses, flipping houses, flipping houses. And I remember talking to my dad about Amazon. And he urged me to get in touch with Amazon's real estate department because you know Amazon could do this amazing thing, right? Take some dirt, have somebody 
we build a warehouse, sign a lease, and now it's gold. So I started really thinking about commercial real estate and how I wanted to get into it. And eventually, when I, after I left Amazon, I left full-time house flipping and went to a commercial real estate brokerage, net lease brokerage. That was about five years ago. And I never looked back. I've been 100% full-time in commercial real estate brokerage for the last five years. And I would say I loved every second. There were some difficult times, but I loved just about yeah. all of it. Got it. So a lot to unpack there. I want to kind of just start at the very beginning. So how did you and your friends get into retrofitting, if I can use that word, houses to be handicap accessible? And how do you even go about like selling that or finding that? First of all, I think it's super fascinating because that's a needed service. Because obviously, if you do get find yourself in a situation where maybe you get in a car accident and you're handicapped, like obviously you didn't buy a handicap accessible house, right? So how do you modify it to help ease into your life in that new kind of phase, if you will. So how did it start? I'm curious. Yeah, great question. Out of necessity. So my best friend's father, unfortunately, was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And we saw, you know, in addition to the pain and the suffering of having to go through an illness that can literally take you off your feet in a few years, he had to also go through the difficulty of multiple contractors, right? One contractor for the grab bar, one contractor for the ramp, one contractor for the shower, Mm -hmm. one contractor for the stair glide. So we saw this opportunity of like, hey, let's create a one-stop shop for this needed service, as you said. And then in response to the other part of your question, I, as the sales guy, would go around to you know different nursing homes and assisted living facilities and hospitals and whatnot and have meetings with the people that were in charge of discharge and say, hey, listen, I know that you have a need here. Your clients who are leaving this facility are going to go home and you're going to be the one that's going to help them with all these headaches, but we're here to take away the headache. And it was really well received because as you indicated, it was solving problems and it was helping people. And I really enjoyed it just because you know it was tremendously rewarding. And it was great to see my best friends who I grew up with my whole life be able to do something that to me was like such a tribute and an honor to their father who lived very long time with ALS. He actually passed away in, I believe it was 2018. So you know, another 15 or so years after the company was yeah. formed. And you said it's still operational today? Your friend's still running it? They're still running it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Got it. Got it. Interesting. I commend you for that because that is definitely, you're easing somebody that's going through a potentially life-altering scenario, right? And you're making at least their initial transition to that as seamless as possible. So very, very fascinating. I'm always curious about the flipping world. I've never done any flips. It's one of the things you see the flipping channel or stories on HGTV and all that fun stuff. And it looks awesome. But it's cash flow, right? So it's not passive, is right. what I also mean. It's very active. And oh, yeah. yes, you've got contractors that are swinging the hammer and all of that stuff, but you've got to be there managing them. You've got to be there with the capital because it's a, also a capital intensive operation as well. So talk about some of your flips because I'm just kind of curious. And were you doing all this stuff in Detroit or in that area or how did that work? Yeah. So initially I started off literally within like one square mile of my home, very specific neighborhoods. I went to the city. I made this huge map. I still have it somewhere in my office, you know, and I had this whole system. Essentially, I would get someone to drive me and I would drive around the entire neighborhood street by street with pen and paper and look for signs of distress. And then I would mark those homes with certain color coded tabs on the actual map. And then I would literally just go knock on doors. I mean, every Sunday and every evening after work, I was knocking on doors, trying to get people to sell their homes. And we'd buy a home, renovate it, sell it. But, you know, there's so much that goes into it besides just the construction. I mean, you have to source the property, right? You have to have the funds, right? And and that might be some of your own money that very likely is going to be private money loans. You have to have those relationships. And then you have to work through title to get the deal closed, just like you would any, any purchase. And once you close it, you have to manage all the contractors, which, you know, there's tons of things that can come up. And then at that point, I chose to market most properties through a realtor. Even after I became licensed, I always use realtors to sell my properties because it's not what I specialize in. But yeah, I mean, in terms of stories, I mean, let me answer the other question first. It was initially in that one mile radius. I expanded to the surrounding city. And then I expanded out into the county. This was, again, during the recession. So you could buy houses for next to nothing. As I was doing this over the years, the inventory dried up, the prices increased. I actually moved my company, rebranded it into the city of Detroit. And this was before people were really doing a lot of real estate flipping in Detroit. And we had a lot of success there. I think probably one of my favorite flips was in a neighborhood in Detroit, a historic neighborhood, beautiful home built in 1930. I bought it from Chase Bank for laughably low amount of money. It was incredibly gorgeous. No one had lived in it for decades. So what we did was we took this beautiful home with the woodwork and the wainscoting and the archways 
and modernized it, right? We removed the boilers, put in forced air, you know, new bathrooms, new kitchen, refinish the hardwood floors, add some hardwood, and really were able to create a masterpiece. We were able to recreate the facade the way that it looked almost 100 years ago, even though there was a lot of damage to the woodwork. And at the end of the day, I sold this property to a young couple, and they probably, for them, was a great investment. That area really appreciated. But that, to me, it was a labor of love. And not every deal was as sweet as that. Not every story was as as enjoyable. I could tell you other deals where you know I bought properties in the wrong neighborhood, and every time I would do a renovation, the next night the cabinets or the furnace would be stolen. Oh you know? yeah. So it's a hands-on activity. It's very, 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 very labor intensive every step of the way, and it's high risk. It's very high risk. Your, yep. your capital tied up, or other people's capital tied up, often with a personal guarantee. So I still do it occasionally. I flipped one last year, but it's definitely something that I usually don't miss. Yeah, I remember watch, or listening to a podcast, and I think the girl was flipping in Detroit. She was saying she was buying houses for like, I don't know, four or five grand, putting like 10, 15 grand into it, and then renting them for a thousand bucks. And I'm like, holy cow, that's a not a normal scenario no, in most of the country. I think it was kind of right place, right time. But I mean, if you can do it, well, you can make hay, right? So uh, I mean, part of my business model was buy those. And I bought houses for a thousand bucks, two thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. Buy those low end houses, put in whatever you need to do to get it to the place it needs to be. And then part of my business model was I would flip to overseas investors who would mm. then flip again. They would be essentially the liaison to buy yeah. these properties and then give them to their investors as a package. So I was selling to them for 40, 45,000. They were selling to their investors for 70 or 75,000 without doing anything. And then their investors were collecting the thousand bucks a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. How did you find those international investors? That's kind of interesting. So I found them through LinkedIn. I'm an Israeli citizen. I speak almost fluent Hebrew. So, you know, I found them through LinkedIn. We started conversing. I had them over to my home for dinner. And we got to know each other. They needed property. I had some property in my inventory. I flipped one of them to them. And then they asked for a couple more and a couple more. And that's kind of how that relationship began. Got it. Well, I want to kind of transition to the nuts and bolts here, kind of the triple net lease and the commercial stuff that you're doing. But before we do that, I want to take a quick sponsor break. So we'll be right back. Whether you're trying to hire a full-time employee or a contractor to fill a gap, Hire Tomorrow can help. Hire Tomorrow is a boutique recruitment firm that has successfully filled sales and marketing, human resources, and technology positions with companies ranging from startups to Fortune 500. If you're struggling to find the right talent, check out HireTomorrow.com or reach out to recruiting at HireTomorrow.com to see how they can help. All right, we are back on the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. We've got Dan Lukowitz on here, and we were talking about his journey into commercial real estate, started with some kind of mission-driven, kind of accessible housing, retrofitting, and then some flipping. And so obviously, you had a very strategic way that you'd kind of moved your career from starting and building a business with your friends, and then moving into a title company and Amazon and all that stuff to obviously get a very broad exposure to commercial real estate and real estate in general. Was that purposeful? Like, did you have a mapped out plan? And then you're like, okay, I want to spend two years here, learn as much as I can and move on. Like, how did that work? And how did you get the mindset to kind of do that? Yeah. So I didn't have a whiteboard with like the journey in front of me, but I have a very close friend. We're still very close friends. And he always was just kind of like an older brother to me always yeah. talking about career and the future and this and that. And some of these things I discussed with him, but for me, it was like, once I knew real estate was the direction, I wasn't going to go back to school, right? I was married. I had kids and at the time. I still have kids, but I was married to at the time. <laughs> and I decided that the best way to be successful was to learn the things that were elusive. And I'd heard people talk about title. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's frustrating. What's going on? So I said, you know, I need a job to feed my family and I'm good at sales. So here's an opportunity, you know, business development or a sales guy running a sales team at a title agency. Let's take it. And I learned a lot about title and I continued flipping. And then at that point, my move to Amazon was more opportunistic. At that stage of my life, I had never been offered something that was so lucrative. And what's fascinating to me from like a psychology perspective is that for me, that was like the next level. And it really opened up my mind to what was possible. The answer is it was by design. A lot of things happened along the way that were and were not intentional. But the way that I see it is like I was on a journey to do something in real estate. I'm very fortunate that I finally fell into investment sales brokerage because for me, it just makes a lot of sense and I enjoy it. And it just creates a lot of opportunity and also opportunity to help people as well. 
Yeah. So break it down for me. Like I said, I'm not as familiar with your end of the commercial real estate space. So you're selling, well, maybe just give us some examples of the type of assets that you're selling. And then I'm curious also to get your opinion on kind of the state of the market in that side of the house, because, you know, I understand what's going on in the multifamily side, but yeah, I'm curious about your side on that. One. Sure. I mean, literally, as we speak right now, I have a closing going on for a learning experience in Wisconsin. Learning experience is an early childhood education brand. So they rent this property that we are selling for about 5 million bucks and closing two weeks ago for a vacant Burger King in Virginia that had been vacated because the tenant had filed bankruptcy. This client wanted me to sell it as a vacant property. A couple of weeks prior to that, I sold a different Burger King in a different part of Virginia. That was cash flowing, short-term lease, about three and a half years left. Previous deal before that was a shopping center the month prior. That was like 11 tenant shopping center in Michigan. And then before that, I'd sold a shorter term CVS. And before that was another Burger King. I sold actually the Burger King from the owner of the property, sold it to the actual franchisee operator. So those are a good example of last five or six transactions that I've done. But you know, we and primarily... Go ahead. If you're selling a Burger King, are you selling the building or are you selling the building and the business or Only the building. Okay. So, so, so and that's why I'm not that. selling the franchise, the Burger right. King franchise. You're essentially saying, hi, you own a Burger King and here's the building. Exactly. And when you buy the building, you're buying the building with an existing lease in place from the building owner, which is now you to the franchisee. And that's why not all Burger Kings are created equal, right? Like that first one in Texas I mentioned was a yeah. 12 unit operator. So that franchisee was operating that location and 11 others. Okay. The one that I sold most recently, two ago, I should say, was I think a 37 unit operator. I've got a Taco Bell and bring the market in the next couple of weeks. It's a 200 unit operator. So the size of the franchisee is very important because that's going to show you how strong of the guarantee do you have on the lease that's been signed. So the building is being sold, but the tenant that's there. So if you've got an operating Burger King and you're like, holy crap, my building's being sold to a new buyer, that doesn't necessarily impact your business because that new buyer is assuming the lease right. that you've already signed. Is it that right? shouldn't impact your business at all. In fact, and even if you want to call them the new landlord is a bad landlord, it doesn't really exist in triple net because in these properties, the Burger King franchisee is actually the one that pays the taxes, pays the insurance, pays to fix the building, takes care of all repairs, maintenance, shovels the snow, cuts the grass, all that stuff. So franchisee's perspective, there should be business as usual with no interruption and no change whatsoever. Now, yeah. there is an exception to that. And that's what's called a sale leaseback. So sometimes the building owner is the franchisee, right? Mm. So, and he's just renting from himself. Right. Now, the downside of that is that in that case, he's not writing off a rental expense usually. Sometimes he can, but what can happen is he'll do what's called a sale lease back, where I'll help him sell the building to a new owner and then he'll lease back the premises as the franchisee, as the tenant. So in that case now, he's paying rent and he can write off his rent. Another nice thing about it is he might say, well, I own this building cash. I'm operating my business in it. I want to pull some cash out so I can go and expand my business, maybe open a new location or do something. Yeah. Well, if he does a refinance, he's going to be limited to, let's call it roughly 70% of the value of the building. Whereas if he does a sale leaseback, albeit he'll give up ownership. However, he's able to capitalize on every penny of equity that's in that building. And what does triple net lease mean? Like, are there single net leases, like double net leases? Like, what's the net part of it, I guess? Yeah. So net is essentially the fact that the rent that you collect from the tenant is actually net to you, the landlord. I know you mentioned multifamily previously. I like to compare multifamily to triple net. So like for these purposes, let's say we have a small multifamily building that's got 10 units and I'm yep. just making up rough numbers. Let's say it brings in the gross collected rents are $125,000. And then you've got a Wendy's property that brings in gross rent of $125,000. Well, with the multifamily property, you're going to have all kinds of expenses, right? Property management, insurance, taxes, capital expenditures, replacement reserves. You're going to have to shovel the sidewalk. You're going to have to cut the grass and salt the parking lot and pull the snow, all these different things, right? Now, at the end of the day, with multifamily, you might have 125,000 to start, but you might have another 60 or 65,000 in expenses. You might net out 60, 65 grand roughly. With the Wendy's property, the tenant pays your taxes on your building. The tenant pays your insurance on your building. They pay for all repairs. They pay for roof, structure, parking lot, everything, landscaping, snow plowing, all those things. That's what's called an absolute triple net lease. 
the rent is net to the landlord with zero expenses. There is something called a double net lease as well, where the landlord is responsible for roof and structure. So the tenant mm. will still pay for taxes, insurance, common area maintenance, stuff like that. But the landlord will pay for roof and structure and sometimes parking lot. A lot of dollar stores and pharmacy leases are double net leases. There are other leases too, called like a gross modified lease, where you have essentially it's the opposite of absolute triple net. The landlord is collecting 125000 but they have to pay for all expenses. So really, it runs the gamut. The most common is the absolute triple net lease, then the double net lease. Everything else is less common. Of course, in the shopping center arena, you typically have two different types of leases. You have the gross lease where the tenant, let's say, pays 15 bucks a foot and you have to pay everything as the landlord. Or what I advise is the what's called you know a lease that has triple net charges or cam charges where you might pay 15 bucks a foot as a tenant but you also pay three dollars and 72 cents a foot for cam charges and maybe those are reconciled at the end of the year and if the cost to maintain the property goes up your charges go up the nice thing about that is that just like a triple absolute triple net deal with a shopping center deal that has triple net cam charges in it the landlord can have a relative expectation of what his NOI is going to look like year after year. Got it. So if you got a triple net lease as an owner, you own the building, whatever you're paid from the tenant is net to you. Like you yes. don't have any other out-of-pocket expenses to operate that building. Right. Exactly. I'm assuming you still have insurance on the building in case of something happens or is it a requirement of the tenant to handle all that stuff? And then if there's a claim, the tenant gets it? Like, how does that work? So it all depends on the lease. That's a really good technical question. It all depends on the lease. Some leases are structured where both parties will have have insurance. Other leases are structured more commonly where the tenant will take care of mm. all insurance. And it's just a responsibility that so, for example, the landlord owns the building, the tenant has insurance, but the landlord is listed as the individual to whom the claim will be paid in the event of some type of catastrophe. But you'd be surprised. I mean, I've got clients that call me and say, Dan, we had a fire. And I said, okay, did you tell the landlord? And they say, nope. And I said, okay, well, you probably want to. And they're like, well, we're repairing it. We're going to tell them inevitably. And I'm not making light of the fact, yes, yeah, your responsibility. You should tell the landlord. What I'm saying though, is that it's so hands-off that sometimes the landlord don't even know that their buildings are being fixed. I mean, I had another right. example, a Burger King I sold earlier this year. The We got ready to list it. And then I saw that it wasn't open. And I was like, why is it not open? And then the landlord reached out to the tenant and the tenant said, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, a car drove through the building. <laughs> We're not open right now. So again, perfect example. I mean, absentee ownership, very hands-off, not even aware. I mean, contrast that to flipping houses, right? This is their problem. Oh yeah. Well, I guess if you're a triple net lease owner, it can be pretty hands-off because you have no responsibility whatsoever right. to the property, right? You're just right. owning the building, right? Or the land, yeah. whatever. And so, and they maintain everything. That's interesting. And so as an investor, like I'm assuming these are syndicated or you can find syndicators that do this. Who are the buyers that you're working with? Obviously, I don't need names, but like who are the types of yeah. people that you're kind of working with? Really runs the gamut all the way down to the what I call mom and pop, you know, one, two unit owner type investors. I've sold to real estate investment trusts before, publicly traded real estate investment trusts. Is it syndicators? Yeah, absolutely. I've got a client that has a fund, a shopping center fund, and he solicits capital from his investors. And then I show him deals and he buys those deals. So yeah, there is syndication that goes on. I think there's room for more syndication, especially today when multifamily has just been thrown all over the place. And a lot of the cap rates are no longer attractive, even despite the interest rate environment. Yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity, especially in the multi-tenant shopping center space, that's become a very lucrative, exciting space. And it's a space I've specialized in for years now because it's one of the few spaces in commercial real estate where a lot of product is available at a cap rate that's higher than the current interest rates. Interesting. And are these typically, because you're not doing any renovations, right? So if you buy a triple net lease, there's really not a value add proposition. Is that fair? So that's the common misconception is that there's no value add in triple net. On the surface, it makes sense, right? Like, hey, it's cash flowing, the tenant's responsible for everything. What kind of value could I add? So there's really three main types of value add in triple net. The first one, and it has nothing to do with renovating the actual property, which is why I love it. This is my favorite one. The first one is called the blend and extend. 
So a blend and extend is a strategy where you renegotiate the lease with the tenant and you essentially extend the lease in exchange for something. Usually it's a rent reduction. So the classic example I give is, you know, I had a client in Ohio, had a a Walgreens property. Walgreens was paying $290,000 in rent. Okay. So middle of the road rent for Walgreens. This individual had built the building. They had owned it for almost 20 years. There were like 14 months left on the lease. And now the cap rates I'm about to use are no longer accurate because things have changed a little bit. This example is a couple of years old, but it will make sense for the point of this type of strategy. So at 290,000, because there was such a short term left on the lease, there's a relatively high risk in that deal. So that would have traded at approximately a nine cap. So if we do the math, nine cap on $290,000 is 3.222 million. Okay. So let's remember that number, 3.222 million. Yeah. Now I told my client, I said, dude, I'm not selling this for you. We are not selling this. You need to go to Walgreens and ask them for a new 10 year lease. So he went to Walgreens, asked for a new 10 year lease. They said, that's fine. We'll give you a 10 year lease, but we need, need something in exchange. We need you to drop the rent $65,000 a year to 225, which on the surface, you might think, why would anybody agree to that? That's you're losing $65,000 a year in rent. Well, I'll show you exactly why. So at the new lease, 10 year lease, 225,000. At the time when this deal was going on, that would have traded for approximately a 585 cap. So 225,000 at a 585 cap is $3,846,000, okay? That's a delta of approximately $624,000 without lifting a hammer, swinging a hammer, doing anything. All you're doing is renovating the lease. So that's a major value add a lot of investors do. That's number one. Number two is the single tenant, like what I would call the retail repositioning. A great example, I sold a Birking earlier this month and that property was vacant. So that property was purchased. The individual that was purchasing it was negotiating with a major national chain, Starbucks, to lease the property from him. He would have to put in some tenant improvement allowance dollars. Starbucks would do the renovation and spend the money, but at the end, they would ask to be reimbursed for some of their costs. Mm. And then they would sign a 10-year lease with him, double net lease, the landlord is responsible for roof and structure, but now that property is worth way more. So that's like the value add repositioning. Sometimes people will buy deals that have a year left or two years left, cash flow them for a year or two, and then reposition them afterwards. We're seeing a lot of that happening with former bank branches and former pharmacy locations, as well as former restaurants. So that's very common. And then the third and final type that I focus on is your shopping center, your multi-tenant retail reposition. And what that would involve is sometimes putting in some capital expenditures to make the property a little nicer, right? It would involve converting leases from gross leases to triple net leases, right? So if somebody's paying you $12 a foot gross and it's time for a renewal, you might renegotiate and say, I'll keep your lease, to your rent the same, but you got to pay me $3.50 in cam charges so that I'm not paying a gross lease, working with a gross lease anymore. It would also involve signing longer leases, maybe raising rents where appropriate, maybe getting better tenants, right? Decreasing expenses. So as you increase the value of the center and beautify the center, as you raise the rents or convert to triple net leases, and as you lower expenses, you're going to do two things. You're going to increase your NOI, and you're also going to decrease your cap rate. So you're going to be able to use those two forces together in order to create a ton of value add. Yeah. And I guess, what's the risk to the owner of a triple net lease while they're holding it? Like, I guess there's really minimal risk to them. But I guess the biggest risk is a Walgreens or a Burger King or something doesn't renew. And then you're sitting, I'm assuming these things stay vacant, maybe longer than average, but I could be wrong. So listen, at the end of the day, when you have a lease, your lease is guaranteed by whomever, whatever entity signing on the bottom line of that lease. So the risk, there are a few risks. So number one, at the end of the lease, the tenant has options to renew. They may not renew and you're left with a dark box. That's a risk. Okay. Another risk, this is not so common, but I mean, we're seeing it in the fast food space, especially with Burger Kings, is that these tenants are filing for bankruptcy. Mm. When they file for bankruptcy, they can either auction off their leases or they can walk away from their leases. So, you know, just this week, we had a 172 unit operator file for bankruptcy. In March, we had a 90 unit operator file for bankruptcy that was followed by a 120 unit operator filing for bankruptcy. These are huge companies that file for bankruptcy. And, you know, I'm on the other side of this, working with the landlords, the, the, the building owners to help them sell them. 
And, you know, that is definitely a risk. I mean, Rite Aid filed for bankruptcy in the last couple yeah. of years. So there's definitely risks on that side. It's not common, but it's something to consider. And that's why oftentimes you'll see people like buying what they call low rent deals, right? A deal where the rent is replaceable. If you go out and buy a Walgreens that has $450,000 rent, which is common, it's very difficult to replace that rent, right? Yeah. So today I'd be more comfortable with a deal that's paying $150,000 in rent because I can replace that rent if I need to. Yeah. And what are the types of assets that are common for triple net? Are all like fast food joints typically triple net? Are like the standalone Walgreens and CVSs, are they mostly triple net? Like what are the types of businesses that we all use daily that you know are triple net? Yeah. So dollar stores, almost all double net pharmacies. You're right at CVS and Walgreens are typically double net, but there are instances of triple net pharmacy deals. I cannot tell you a single fast food restaurant, major national chain that is, I've ever seen anything other than an absolute triple net deal. So that's really the nature of the space there. Some medical office buildings are absolute triple net. That can be common as far as shopping centers. As I said, they could be gross leases. They could be kind of like a lease that has cam charges or triple net charges built into it. I think that pretty much covers... Uh, what about like the standalone banks, so the big bank chains that have their own little offices? Are they triple net or are they something different? Yeah, those are usually triple net deals, but you know, it, it can really vary. And the funny thing is, is like, even within the same corporation, you know, there's CVS leases that are double net. Yeah. Roof and structure is landlord responsibility. There's CVS leases, roof structure parking are landlord responsibility. And there's CVS leases where nothing is landlord responsibility. So it's kind of funny how that works out. But you know, yeah. I do tell my clients, even if you have an absolute triple net lease, spend the 500, 700 bucks every couple of years to get a property condition assessment. Because like, I'll give you a great example. I sold a CVS earlier this year, absolute triple net, local guy, but he had really never been to the property and CVS didn't really want to be there. They actually subsequent to the sale ended up vacating. But when it came time for the buyer to do his inspection, his inspector came up, even though it was absolute triple net came up with $275,000 of property deficiencies, legitimate property deficiencies. I went to the property, parking lot was terrible. The condition of the building was terrible. The roof was terrible. Had this individual done a property condition assessment, he could have gotten that information, paid his attorney 300 bucks or whatever to send a letter to CVS. Per the lease, you have 30 days to fix these things. So yeah. that's advice I give all my clients. And I think it's really important. Yeah. Want to make sure you're covering your basis, right? Because yeah. if your pans off, you can be left holding the bag, so to speak. So we went down a really big rabbit hole there. I'm very curious about this space. So I think it was super interesting. What's the market like? Obviously, are these things being bought with like variable rate debt or is it all fixed rate long-term debt? Because obviously that will change depending on if or how much they're impacted by the rate hikes that have gone on in the last few years. Yeah. So, I mean... I don't even know where to start on that. I mean, it typically is bought in my experience with fixed rate debt, but I've got a client right now I'm selling some buildings for. I actually sold them these buildings back in 2021. So two and a half years ago, 2000, yeah, 2021, two and a half years ago. And they did not, they didn't have rate caps and they have floating debt and they're in trouble because yeah. the cash flow is great at three and a quarter, right? But now when rates are in the sevens, it's not so great. So in general, it's typically fixed rate debt. I mean, I think that just depends on the debt market in terms of what's going on. But in the market overall, I mean, look, I don't need to tell you, it's been 18 months roughly. We've seen 11 rate hikes, I believe, 550 basis points of swing the federal funds rate from effectively zero to about five and a half percent, 550 basis points. If you look all across the net lease, all the different types of products I've been talking about, dollar stores probably have swung the most during that period. And that's because they compressed the most over the last decade, and we're still only seeing 100 or 125 basis points of swing. You look at like fast food, typical fast food between 18 months ago and today is 50 basis point swing. So I mean, really net lease is very stable, very secure. The cap rates are very sticky. They have not yeah. moved much. I will tell you that when you could get debt at 3%, those five cap deals were flying, right? Today, yeah. those five cap deals are hard to work with. I personally, about two years ago when I saw things starting to shift, I started to shift my focus away from more of those bread and butter, vanilla, absolute triple net, low cap deals, more to what I described to you, right? Like higher cap shopping centers, like the nine cap shopping centers, short-term CVSs, vacant Burger Kings, short-term Burger Kings, you know, things where the cap rate was going to be higher because I knew that 
it would just be much easier to work with products that can be bought cash or finance versus yeah. a five cap deal that no one's really financing anymore. So definitely market volume, transactional volume has gone down, although the last two months it is starting to creep back up. Me okay. personally, my team, our volume, our business is booming. It's as strong as ever, but I believe that's largely due to the fact that we really pivoted. But in general, major brokerage houses are definitely struggling. I think that as rates stabilize, I really firmly believe that there's a huge influx of capital, dry powder waiting on the sidelines. I see lots of good times ahead. Yeah, I think that's kind of where I feel like the sentiment is kind of growing more consistent with people that are thinking about 24 as a buying opportunity, right? Especially because there's a lot of risk in a lot of these variable rate debt deals, right? Because there's a lot of distress. So I think there could be some buying opportunities for sure uh, in the new year. So I want to kind of pivot to the kind of the end of the conversation here, because I think I've gotten a lot out of this. So I want to be respectful of time and everything. So I've got a three pack of questions that I ask everybody that comes on the podcast. So question one is what's one piece of advice that got you started or helped you along your real estate investing journey? Yeah, this is not specific to real estate, but I remember there was an individual I met here locally and I was like a young hustler, like excited about business. And I asked him, I said, what well, was the exact question you just asked? What's one piece of advice that you would give someone like me? And he said, find a mentor and make yourself dumb in front of him. Mm-hmm. Right. And I said, okay, I found a man. Let's do this. You know? Right, right. You're the guy. Like that was exactly, that was- exactly. And that was brilliant because it's so true. I mean, especially in my younger years, I always like to show people how much I knew, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's a waste. Like I think that's really a waste. If you can find a mentor or mentors and make yourself dumb, don't try to learn, like don't try to show them how much you know, find out how much they know and try to soak up as much as you can. I always tell people, all you got to do is ask the following question. If you ask people, how can I add value to you? I mean, you're very rarely going to get an answer that's not going to lead to something fruitful. Everyone wants somebody to add value to them. So if you're a person that's going to add value and make yourself dumb in front of people and find a mentor, that I think is a really, those are great keys to success. No, I like that. I like that. I find myself being dumb in front of a lot of people, whether they're a mentor or not. So uh, (laughs) what's the favorite real estate or business book that you're into right now? So this book is incredible. This book is called Influence the Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Caldini. It's all about business psychology. It's incredible. I love that book. I think it's just dynamite, absolute dynamite for anyone in sales or or real estate. I'm not a multifamily guy. I have it on my bookshelf. I have it on my bookshelf. Yeah. 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 I'm not a multifamily guy myself per se, but there's a book called Multifamily Millions by Dave Lindahl. Great book. Mm -hmm. If you're into multifamily, really great book. Yeah. I've heard of that one. I haven't picked it up yet, but it's good to be reminded for sure. But yeah, Influence is a good book. I like that a lot. Yeah. There's, um, so, there's so many though. And then obviously Think and Grow Rich. I mean, I read that book the first time and I was like, this stuff is so stupid. And I read it again. And I probably read that book seven times. And every time I'm just like taking more in and taking more in. And it's so incredible because especially in business, like your mentality and your mindset is what defines your, your reality and your future. Yeah, there's a few books that I kind of revisit every so often because they're good. And they're also, it's good to get like refreshers because you pick up, it's like watching a movie multiple times. You pick up yeah. different nuance every time you watch it. So yeah, there's a few that I kind of just repeat every few years. So, all right, final question here. If you hit your financial freedom number, meaning you could live an amazing life off the passive income from your investments, what would you do? I have to say, I would keep working as a broker. Like I love it so much. I love finding deals and hustling for deals and selling deals. And like, I just love that feeling. I'm going to get off this podcast here and talk to my junior broker and help celebrate his deal that was closed while we're doing this. So I would definitely do that. I would travel a lot more. I'm a big car guy. So okay. you know, I have my Dodge Viper and I would probably go to the track every single day. I love the track so much. Um, Wait, you have a Dodge Viper, like a proper back in the day Viper? So I currently do not. I did have a 93 Viper, which was a Gen okay. 1, as well as a 2002, which is a Gen 2. I really have my eyes set on the Gen 5, newer one. I love Vipers ever since I was a kid, hanging out at the Viper plant with my friends and his dad. But yeah, I mean, I would drive a lot and I would teach. I love commercial real estate. I would help many people as I can, mentor as many people and try to help other people be successful and help them change their lives and just have fun. Yeah, no, I like it. Well, people want to get in touch with you, whether they're looking to maybe get into the triple net lease or they want to learn about like flipping houses or anything like that. How can they kind of find you? What's the best way to reach out? Yeah. So first of all, I'm very active on LinkedIn. You can find me there. First name is Dan, last name Lukowitz, L-E-W-K-O-W-I-C-Z. Again, L-E-W-K-O-W-I-C-Z. 
If you have property, you want to know what it's worth or you want to sell it. If you're an investor or you're an aspiring investor or a broker, you just want to talk shop. If you have a deal, even if it's not my deal, but you just want an extra set of eyes on it, an extra another opinion, please reach out. I'll give out my direct cell phone number. It's 248-943-2838. Again, 248-943-2838. Whatever I can do to add value, it would definitely be my pleasure. Awesome. Dan, man, appreciate you being on the podcast. This was awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. I hope you got value out of this episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Your one-stop shop for education on how you can continue to work hard in your career and have different options to invest even harder. If you took anything away from this episode, please like and comment. I read every comment as it helps me serve you better. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you won't miss out on more valuable content. If you're watching this video, it means that you want to grow your passive real estate portfolio. The easiest way to do that is to join our investor club by heading to greatventurecapital.com slash invest. The link is in the show notes. See you on the next episode.